Hey there, I'm Dr. Ben Britton. This is section seven of the introduction to electron backscatter diffraction lecture. In this lecture, we're gonna look at this component of the lecture. We're gonna look at how we conduct an EBSD experiment and some tips and tricks to improve your measurements themselves. If you've been following so far, we're almost there. This is the last thinking segment. Uh, section eight will give you some inspiration, hopefully, for other ways we can use EBSD data to tell us uh, cool and exciting things. So it sounds kind of simple, but the most important thing if you're gonna do an EBSD experiment is to design it well. And so you should have a plan with what you want to obtain. Your first few EBSD experiments may be just, can I get it to diffract? Will it, do I understand what, what all this information is telling me? As you get a bit better, you'll have to think a little bit, you know, what do you really want to learn? For instance, if you have a single orientation crystal, then you may want to know that orientation exquisitely. So you may want to think carefully about how you have sampled the orientation, whether you've done the best measurements you could do, whether you've cut the single crystal and mounted it particularly well. If you want to do grain size, have you sampled enough area? Do you have a good enough polish that you don't have sampled biasing? Do you know what distribution and sectioning? Do you have to worry about the 3D morphology of the system? If you're doing texture, are you doing macro, so the average texture across the object, or are you doing micro, so a specific domain or cluster of phases? Or particularly, you know, maybe it's the recrystallization grains that you care about. Do you want to identify cl or classify the particular phases? Would you like to understand something about the strain in the system? So if you've got a good idea about what you want to do, and there are many more experiments that can be done, the next thing you want to do is to prepare your samples well. This will be an iterative process, and we'll have some ideas and tips and tricks for how to do that in a moment. Then the final aspect is, of course, to optimize the microscope, both the electron beam and the EBSD experiment, to get the best quality diffraction patterns for your analysis. So for sample preparation, many of you will have to do metallography. You'll be doing polishing to effectively try and remove any impact of the sectioning process to then get access to the crystals. If we remember that the EBSD is formed from the top 20 nanometers, we have to have a very good quality surface finish. This is a beautiful experiment conducted by Matt Knoll that shows effectively if you improve and increase the duration, so you're decreasing the size of the media and increasing the duration, you can increase the clarity of the diffraction patterns. Do note that even at this point, you may be able to get something like the texture out. So actually, you know, a relatively short polish can give you a good quality map for some of the experiments that you may want to do. This is finishing with a colloidal silica step, but you could finish with a variety of uh, approaches and we'll discuss them very shortly on the next page. The majority of samples you'll look at, you're not gonna be the first one to do an EBSD experiment, so do talk to people in your research group, have a look on the internet, look at example papers, feel free to email people to ask stuff. One important aspect is that surface roughness can create shadowing, especially in the highly tilted configuration, and so things like deep etches could be problematic. Just one example is if you do the polishing badly, you can get evidence of the polishing and not of the microstructure. This is a beautiful example from a weld in 304 stainless. There is a transformation that can happen during polishing, uh, and that gives effectively rise to fragmentation of the grain structure. If you remove that surface polishing damage with an electro polish, so use a chemical attack uh, with a, a applied voltage, you can get a, a much more representation, much better representation of the microstructure that's present in your material. So improper sample preparation can induce artifacts. This can produce things like sample uh, polishing induced martensite formation, for example. You could get the introduction of hydrides that may look FCC-like in a titanium-like microstructure. Um, you could also get it that some phases are preferentially ripped out or pulled out of the material. You haven't retained, say, a precipitate in the material. Or that, that one phase is preferentially polishing faster than another. There are a whole range of strategies for preparation. So you want to aim for a clean sample with no residual polishing damage. It is effectively sample dependent, so talk to your group or colleagues in this space. The variety of methods that are present, you can use low KV argon iron polishers, 
such as the PEC system uh, that's at Imperial College. You could have electropolishing to do a chemical attack removal uh, with a voltage. You could do a chemical, just an etch to remove stuff. You could use a vibrate, vibratory polish system that is a gentler than a rotary polish. You can, in some instances, look at facets from pure fracture surfaces. In some materials, a vacuum annealing process can clean up and remove surface defects. You could do fib cross-sectioning and fib polishing for certain samples, like particles, for instance, if you want to do looking at inside, say, gas atomized particles, etc. Um, plasma cleaning of your samples will be useful to remove hydrocarbons. They can be particularly bad in terms of contamination, especially at the high probe currents and voltages uh, and uh, long duration dwells for EBSD. You want to ensure a conductive path in your sample. For some mineralogy experiments, you may want to have variable pressure. That can be important. And uh, if you get uh, in the habit of this, you can effectively evaluate quality with things like backscatter electron imaging prior to your EBSD experiment. There's a whole range of cool tips and tricks uh, by uh, Dr. Joe Michael uh, that's presented in this uh, Sandia paper uh, or presentation uh, to have a look at. Once you've got a good sample prep, you need to optimize the microscope. You want to align the probe, see the SEM lecture notes on how to do that. A smaller probe gives you cleaner diffraction patterns, but do recall that annealed samples with large maps do not need a great probe, so you can use a cheaper microscope for those things. You'll want to align the sample as well as possible to choose a sensible sample axis system as you cut the sample and as you mount it in the microscope. And you want to manage and correct the scan rotation and tilt correction. See one of the other earlier sections of this lecture for that, set, that information. <clears throat> the tilt correction is very important. This is important with regards to thinking about the scanning path, the highly tilted and the foreshortening corrections. You typically will do the correction on the microscope. Do check this. Do check effectively that if you're reproducing your sample, it looks like you imagine it being flat. Try and align the tilt axis. The most true axis of your sample should be along the tilt configuration and, and correct with the scan rotation. Uh, there are a whole range of discussions on this, uh, both in the true BSD paper that I've mentioned previously, but also in the NOLSA paper that has some of the distortions also present uh, in uh, the imaging modes. For an EBSD experiment, the angular resolution, there are two resolutions that are important. The absolute orientation is important and that's related to the sample mounting and the microscope setup. There are a whole range of methods to get this within one degree. Typical methods will typically be within two or three degrees and the most important aspect is how well you cut and mount your sample. The misorientation resolution, that is the point-to-point -point orientation within the same map, is dependent on the software interpretation. In Hoth-based approaches, it's typically around 0.5 degrees. You can get two orders of magnitude better if you use high-resolution or cross-correlation EBSD. I'll touch on that in, in the final section. Um, and some pattern matching, which I'll again I'll talk in the final section, can be accessing typically somewhere between, uh, say, 0.1 to 0 0.05 degrees. Uh, for those methods. It depends a little bit on a few settings. But point-to-point -point misorientation is far better than absolute is one important aspect. To set up the microscope, a large aperture often enables you to get more electrons down the column, so it's uh, more electrons per unit time, it's a higher probe current. In some instruments this may also be achieved by changing the condenser lens settings that effectively changes how many electrons go down the sample by changing the beam divergence before it goes through the aperture. Often a large aperture or a large, uh, however you set the condenser lens to get a large current can reduce the physical spatial resolution, so be slightly careful. Other bits that are important in the uh, electron diffraction pattern, you can change the gain or contrast of the signal. That's effectively software corrections that may amplify noise, but it could, can make the software algorithms behave a bit better. More importantly though, is trying to optimize to get the highest number of effectively photons counted from the phosphor being illuminated or number of electrons counted fundamentally by having a high DQE system with uh, a high current and a long exposure time, or, or specifically, you want to have the long enough exposure time such that you can get away with sampling the largest area you can manage per unit time of microscope. 
To set this up, you need to consider the gray level distributions in the raw pattern and in the background correction pattern. You want to avoid saturation in the diffraction pattern. And uh, typically you want to use the gain sparingly. And so that's effectively try to uh, reduce the amount of noise. Fundamentally, what we care about is the total electron dose per pattern. That's what's really important. This is the time times probe current is the dose that's being used to generate the diffraction pattern. And then there is geometry and hardware that follow of how well you can capture that. The signal quality is a function of the sample prep is the first order problem. The second order is how good the equipment is set up and how good you're operating it. The spatial resolution is uh, controlled by the emitter type. So typically a FEG will have a, a effectively a sharper uh, resolution, typically somewhere of the order of between 10 and 100 nanometers. Um, the FEG also is relatively insensitive for probe currents. Whereas if you have a tungsten filament, this is what they call SEM here, a tungsten filament, it has a sharper setup in here. Um, it's also related to the probe current in here. The, importantly, the physical resolution is where the scattering occurs, but the effective resolution is how well you can classify, index, and distinguish two diffraction patterns. That's a software problem, and that's relating to the pattern deconvolution and indexing routines. You can get this down to about 20 nanometers in a FEGSEM at 20 kilo electron volts in X and Z. But remember, it's three times elongated in Y down the tilt axis. If you want to measure grain size, do think about this because typically you require 10 points within the grain for a relative estimation of the grain size in this case. Uh, this is uh, described in more detail in the Humphreys paper of how that's set up. So that will give you an idea of the minimum grain size you can measure with conventional EBSD. Higher spatial resolutions can be achieved with a, a fancier method. I will describe that in the final section of uh, the lectures. Accelerating voltage, that will change how far the electron probes into the sample. This can be useful to get through sample coatings or surface damage. But do recall at higher voltage, effectively, the Bragg angle changes, so you get narrower bands but you also get higher efficiency phosphor, phosphorescence, or, or sorry, generation of photons. If you have too low a voltage, you can get effectively poor illumination of the diffraction pattern, which means you have to make it account for a longer time. Uh, typically, we will use 15 to 13 keV. Often, if I was suggesting anyone to start, start at 20, but you may want to play around and play and do an experiment to work this out. Other aspects that can impact this are related to the geometry of the sample and detector. So one effectively is the sample position with regards to the detector. In some systems you can move the detector up and down. In some systems you just can only move the sample up and down. So the sample up and down is changing the working distance. Generally a shorter working distance gives you a higher spatial resolution because the probe can be formed better, but you have a lower depth of field in your highly tilted configuration, this means you lose focus relatively quickly. This may be compensated through what's called a dynamic focus correction. If you drop the sample lower, this can be good for effectively larger area scannings because you have a higher depth of field, but you can reduce the spatial resolution in your problem. And importantly, the pattern center will move down the detector. So you have to be careful about PCY in this case. <clears throat> Also, at low working distance, you're more likely to hit stuff, uh, specifically the very expensive pole piece. Please don't hit the pole piece, it's an expensive thing to fix. Uh, so this is generally safer, especially for rougher samples. The other aspect of geometry is that you can move the detector. So if you move the detector close to the sample, effectively the uh, camera angle subtended is larger, so you'll see a greater angular range across the diffraction pattern. Now you'll decay the diffraction pattern, the signal to noise towards the edge will decrease quite fast if it's not set up well. Uh, this is a very nice diffraction pattern, I spent some while on this. If you zoom, uh, if you pull the detector backwards, you may have to count longer because the angle subtended by per pixel effectively is larger in this case. Um, and effectively you're going to look at a smaller area of the diffraction pattern. This could be useful if you want to look at how this zone axis structure is varying. But if, for instance, you're trying to understand some low symmetry crystal, you may require more balance.